Hi, this is Brock Lemires, author of Embedded System Design using the MSP430 FR2355 Launchpad Board. In this video, I'm going to talk about uh, what an embedded computer or an embedded system is and kind of set the motivation for the rest of the content that is covered in this book. So when you think about the word computer, what comes to mind? Usually people think about uh, their laptop or their workstation. Sometimes even people even think about their smartphone or maybe even a tablet. But what people usually don't think about are all the computers that are embedded in all the systems that surround us in our daily lives. So for example, uh, you walk into a kitchen, the microwave oven has a computer in it, the dishwasher has a computer in it, your coffee pot has a computer in it. You go into your car, the radio is controlled by a computer, the, the motor controllers in the mirrors are controlled by a computer. You look around your your office and you see, you know, you have a radio, it's controlled by a computer. You have a projector that has a computer in it. So there's just tons of these little computers that exist in all the electronics that we have in our lives that are truly computers. And they are much different than the computers that actually run our laptops or our workstations. Uh, these computers are much smaller and they are what we call embedded within the system that they control. So we use the term embedded systems to define all of these different uh, things that exist in our society that have a computer embedded within them that controls their operation. So we use terms like embedded computers or embedded systems to basically describe this entire uh, content area. Okay, so let's start our discussion about computers by creating basically categorizing computers into two broad groups. So the first one is going to be general purpose computers. And these are the ones that we, we think about that run our laptops and our workstations. And let's think about the characteristics of these computers just for a second. So these computers are designed to run an, a wide variety of software. And in fact, they're designed to run software that may not even have been created yet. And so users are going to be able to install any software that they want. They're going to be able to uninstall software. They're going to have many, many different types of software installed where they might be even running multiple pieces of software at the same time. But they're designed to just run anything and everything that a user can think of. So one of the outcomes of that, though, is that the computer, the computer hardware, must have an abundance of resources in order to support all these different types of computer applications that that may be running on it. And so this means that you're going to have to have, a, you know, a, a central processing unit that's fast enough to handle all these different applications, even if some of them don't need the speed, another application might need the speed. So you never know, you're going to have to have large amounts of program memory to hold all these different programs, because you don't really know how big they're ultimately going to be, you're going to have to have a lot of data memory to hold, uh, interim computations just in case something needs it. And so when you start getting this much, these, this amount of resources, it becomes very difficult for any one program to actually manage that and it becomes kind of tedious. So these computers have been designed to have what's called an operating system on there. And so these are the operating systems that you've heard of, things like Windows or Mac OS, iOS. Uh, and what these operating systems are, they serve as resource managers. So they're the ones, they're gonna sit on the computer hardware and they are gonna handle uh, how many, how much memory a particular application might need or they're gonna handle the interface between an application and maybe the keyboard or the display. And they handle that, all the hardware resources so that every piece of software uh, can be written without really worrying about that. But they're very sophisticated, uh, they're very sophisticated pieces of, of software that run on there. And so that's one of the one of the things that are, is a characteristic of these general purpose computers. Another thing about general purpose computers are if you think about your laptop or a workstation, it's designed for heavy user interaction. I mean, it's designed to have a human sitting there running a keyboard or a mouse and looking at the display. And so it's designed to have uh, I.O. or inner input output from a human. Now you are going to absolutely have other IO such as, you know, internet connections, but it's designed so that a human being is the one that's benefiting from running the software. Now when you do this, what's interesting is that you have all these hardware resources to run all this different, you know, all this different software. Most of the time, the majority of the resources are sitting idle in these computers, in these general purpose computers. 
And that's because if you think about it, you're when you're typing an email, you're only using a very small part of the computer's functionality, the, the ability to read a key and actually print the, the character on or in a document. And so all the other stuff that, that the computer can do, it's actually not doing that. And so there, there is some inefficiency in terms of uh, using all the resources, but it doesn't really matter because the resources are there to support any arbitrary software that could potentially ever be run. So one of the things that happens, though, is that to support all these different uh, soft, all this different software and to have all these resources, these computers tend to be expensive. And I'll say relatively expensive uh, because we're talking about when you go buy a laptop, I mean, it, it's it can be a thousand dollars. It can be a couple thousand dollars when you look at general purpose uh, microprocessors. I mean, they can be hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars for the high end processors. So they're not they're not you know, costing pennies, they're costing something that is noticeable. And another another characteristic of these computers is that to support the large amounts of hardware resources, you tend to have to buy or tend to break up these computers into multiple integrated circuits. So you'll tend to see computers, if you break open your workstation, you'll see one integrated circuit that is going to serve as your microprocessor. So this is going to be like your i7, uh, from Intel, and it's going to be just running the central processing unit functionality. And then you'll see other devices on there, such as uh, memory chips. So you'll have DDR memory on there that, that serves as your program memory, or it serves as your data memory. And you're going to see other devices on there to, to have uh, non-volatile storage. And so things seem to be, or tend to be more distributed in these general purpose computers. And so those are the characteristics of, of just what we think about when you think about a computer. All right, so now let's flip over and let's think about an embedded computer. Okay, so now an embedded computer is gonna have a very specific application. So things like running a toaster or running a coffee pot or, or controlling a motor. And so what ends up happening is that the applications don't really require the super high performance that a general purpose computer has. And so you can have very useful computers, but they don't run as fast and they don't have as many resources. And that's because they're designed to do one specific task, which is control the application or, or the device that they're within. Consider a coffee maker. I mean, it takes inputs from buttons or maybe from a clock, and then it outputs uh, control signals to a heater and a water pump. It, it's very simple. It's taking in inputs and it's creating outputs. Uh, one of the one of the terms that you see also when you think about these embedded computers is they are called microcontrollers. So they're micro because they're on an integrated circuit uh, based upon a microprocessor, but they are controlling the system that they sit within. So you'll also have them be called microcontrollers or MCUs. So the term embedded computer, embedded systems, microcontrollers, they all are the terms that we use to describe these very uh, application specific computer computer chips, okay? Uh, the resources that they need, like I said, they don't need to be massive, they just need to have enough. So they need just enough resources in terms of how many IO, how much processing power, how much memory they need to get the job done. Now, in order to accommodate the variety of different systems that they might reside in, microcontrollers or embedded computers have uh, kind of evolved to contain very common peripherals. So things like uh, timer systems, uh, analog to digital converters, digital to analog converters, serial interfaces. These types of peripherals tend to be, or they are, they're embedded on the same chip as the central processing unit. And in addition to all of the memory that you need. So this is really neat because you can actually implement the entire embedded computer or microcontroller on a single integrated circuit or a single part. And that starts to really show the versatility of these computers because think about how small they can become. Think about a thumb drive, for example, that has a microcontroller on it to control its interaction. That thing is very small. Think about you know a motor controller in the, the mirror of your car. They don't need to be huge. Okay, so <clears throat> this is great. These are very useful. Uh, another thing is that you don't necessarily run Windows on these things. They're very dedicated in terms of the way that the software is written to control the hardware, and it becomes very optimized. Okay, so you have this very tight coupling between the hardware and the software, 
And in fact, they're not necessarily designed to have their software changed very often after the microcontroller is deployed. So think about your coffee maker. I mean, how many times have you upgraded the software in your coffee maker? You probably never will. Uh, yeah, you never will. You really never will <laughs> upgrade the software in your coffee pot. So as a result, what they tend to call the software uh, that's in these microcontrollers, that we call it firmware. And that's trying to kind of show that it's like once that software is is written and it gets into its final form, once that chip is then placed into the system that it's going to control, it's really not intended to be changed frequently. So that's the term firmware. Okay, now you can potentially put operating systems on these embedded computers or microcontrollers, but they tend to be much different than what you think about when you look at like a Windows operating system. Uh, really what these operating systems are on microcontrollers is their task schedulers. So if you think about you're reading from a variety of sensors and then you're producing outputs, you might set up a system that manages when you read from sensor A, when you read from sensor B, uh, and then when you produce the output. So these task schedulers, uh, they have a name and they're called real-time operating systems or RTOSs. <clears throat> and so they're, they're much different, but they can, they can exist in embedded computers. Okay, so now when you think about these small single chip uh, devices, these are small in terms of resources, but they are very inexpensive. So when we talk about general purpose computers costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, these things can be literally pennies. So you can purchase one of these microcontroller chips for 10 cents or 25 cents, or some of the big ones might be a couple dollars. And as a result of that, what happens is that uh, in addition to the cost, you think about the number of applications, there is a significant number or a significantly more, significantly higher number of embedded computers sold than there are general purpose sold. In 2018, the reports were there were 25 billion, 25 billion with a B embedded computers sold versus the 400 million general purpose uh, computers. So it, it's an order of magnitude larger uh, in terms of the volume that you know, the volume that is seen. And if you think about it, just, just walk into a house or walk into an office and look around at every piece of electronics, it has a computer in it, and now think about which ones are embedded computers and which ones are general purpose computers. You're gonna walk in, you're gonna see a laptop, maybe a couple laptops, but then you look around, you start seeing other things like a printer or a coffee maker or a thermostat on a wall. There's just far more applications in our daily lives that use embedded computers compared to general purpose computers. Okay, now if you think about this, is, uh, this chart right here kind of shows some of the applications and it shows you embedded computers versus general purpose computers. But one of the things that's interesting is the smartphone and tablet uh, kind of evolution. So in the beginning, smartphones, they weren't, they weren't very smart, but in tablets, they basically were considered embedded computers because they, they had a limited number of tasks that they could do. So the first kind of personal desktop assistants came out and they could do scheduling. So they had calendars on them and then they kind of started being able to do email. And then when they put those on, in conjunction with phones, you had like the, smurf, the first quasi smartphone but they were still considered embedded computers because when they shipped, they basically could do a certain number of tasks. Same thing with when tablets came out. But now smartphones and tablets tend to be grouped into the general purpose computer bubble. And that's because if you think about your smartphone today, it, the architecture of it evolved to support arbitrary number of applications or apps, and that required the system to have an operating system. So you're gonna have Android operating systems that can run uh, apps that haven't it you know apps that haven't even been written yet and then you can have the the ios app, uh, operating system that can run any any app so they tend to start looking like your windows or or ios type uh, computer systems okay so now if you think about this to wrap it up with if we want to learn about computers why do we start with embedded computers so in education what we tend to do is we start with embedded computers because they're cheap okay so we can actually Takes, we can actually have a computer that every student has and you can you can learn to program it. And it's really great because when you learn about the hardware, uh, you're at a very low level. So you're moving information in and out of memory, you're moving it to the IO. So you gain an understanding of how a computer works, but you do it at the low level at an embedded, embedded system kind of scale. And what's great about that 
because you, you do learn about computers because they are absolutely computers, but you learn about the low level hardware, you get to interact with it, they're cheap enough so that everybody can have one that they're programming on. And in the end, you have knowledge about how a computer works. You also have knowledge on how to design an embedded system. So you walk away with a tangible skill. So let's take a look uh, as we wrap this up at the embedded system that we're gonna use in this class or in this book. And this right here is going to be the MSP430 launch pad. Now, this particular, there's a bunch of different launch pads. Launch pad refers to the, the red board. Uh, and then there's a microcontroller on it. And this one right here is an MSP430. And the variant that we use is the uh, uh, FR2355. And that just, we'll talk about what that means. It just means, you know, it has a certain number of I.O. and a certain number of resources. But that right there is the computer that we're going to be programming. And this little launch pad, launch pad board, it gives us the ability to develop programs and test kind of some basic input output. Uh, it's got LEDs, it's, it's got buttons, it's got pins that we can drive. It also has serial I.O., it has A to D capability. And so, and, and most importantly, it has this circuitry over here, which is, gonna, which is called a debugger. And we're going to be able to use this to slowly or to interact with the microcontroller software execution and kind of like step in and execute instruction by instruction. And this is the platform that we're going to use to learn about embedded systems. But this actually is about what an embedded system might look like. If you think about popping open, you know, like your coffee maker, you're going to see something very similar to this. You're going to see a, a printed circuit board with some basic uh, peripherals around the outside. And then you're going to see at its core a microcontroller chip. So this is very representative of the type of embedded systems that we might see. Okay, that is it. And that is a general overview of an embedded computer.